Uh, my name is Joe. If we haven't gotten the chance to meet, hey, everybody. Joe, your name is? The Church of God. There you go. <laughs> um, I'm super excited and honored to be speaking today. Anytime that I get, a, get to be up here and speak, um, it just excites me. And the nervousness, hey, Jasmine, the nervousness that I feel. Yo, Jasmine preached last Friday for young adults, and it was so good. But anyway, I'm super excited to be speaking. I'm not the normal speaker here. If you're part of our house, you know that uh, Pastor Mark, normally speaking, um, our pastors, I want to excuse them, they are um, at our Kensington campus today. And so technically, me and my dad are preaching at the same time, and it's pretty cool. And so I'm excited about that. But yeah, I'm super excited to speak with you guys today. Um, the word preaching is a little intimidating to me, so I just like to use the word teaching. And so I'm going to be teaching you guys today. I never liked school. I was really bad at it. Math just wasn't my thing. Um, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Yeah, no, nah, I don't. Joe no square. So, uh, <laughs> but um, when I started pursuing um, and really taking my walk with the Lord seriously, the Bible just came alive to me. And there's nothing more exciting to me than reading the Bible and learning scripture and hearing from the Lord. And so today, I'm forcing you all to do it with me. And we're going to learn a little bit. Everybody, anybody ready to learn today? So sit up straight in your chair, mute your phones, and get your notebook out. And test your pen on the corner so you make sure it works. Before we start, um, I'm going to pray. And so I'm actually going to ask that we just stand real quick while I pray and just prepare our hearts for what the Lord is going to speak to us this morning, because I know that he's speaking and I'm ready to hear from him. And so, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for um, your sons and your daughters that are in this room today. Lord, I pray that your word would uh, just permeate into our hearts today, Lord, and that our hearts would be like good and fertile soil for you, Lord, and that the word that is released today, Lord, would be planted and rooted into our hearts, Lord, and that it would take root, Lord. I pray that every word that leaves my mouth today, Lord, would come from you, Lord, and that I would just be a vessel, Lord. And I pray that your church would be built and that it would be edified by what will be shared and taught today. And Lord, I just thank you for your presence that is already in this room. I pray that you would make us, your sons and your daughters, more aware of your presence here with us, Lord. And so I thank you. Can we just thank him for his presence? Thank you, Lord, for your freely given presence. We love you, Lord. It's in your name that we pray that we all say Amen. All right, so we're going to be jumping around the Bible a lot. Actually, not too much, but you are going to, if you have your Bible, we're going to use it. Um, your Bible is so important. It is your sword, um, more important than any skill you can learn or thing you can do. The most important weapon that you have in this life, the most important tool that you have in this life is your Bible. Um, I wrote on the, bi on the bottom of my Bible, on the spot, I don't know if this is called the spine of it still, but the part of it, the really small print, it's a sword. And so every time that I pick up my Bible, I'm reminded of what it really is. It's not just a book with words, but it's a sword that helps me fight through everything. Um, and so, yeah, I'm super excited to get started. We're going to get started. Ah! All right. The title of my message is Find Me Faithful. And I'm super excited to share what that means. We're going to be diving into what pleases the heart of God and what it looks like to trust in God even at the lowest points in our lives. We're going to start in the first book of the Bible, which is Genesis, and we're going to start in chapter 37. We're going to be focusing primarily on um, the story of a young man also named Joseph. I didn't pick him because we have the same name. I picked him because he has a really great story. Um, the story of Joseph is one of my favorite stories in the entire scripture. It's one that I'm sure many of you know very well. If you grew up in church, we've all heard it before. Um, and if you didn't, I'm excited for you to learn a little bit more about it today. And we're going to jump right into it. Genesis chapter 37. And we're going to start with verses 2 through 4. Um, and this is just to lay some groundwork for us. It will also be behind you there. Um, I'm going to read it from there. So I'm gonna, we're going to start at verse 2, but then I'm going to skip through verse 2 and go straight to 3. Cool? Cool. So it says, Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. Straight on to verse 3. It says, now Israel... Israel is Joseph's father, also known as Jacob. Here's some Bible for some of you who don't know it. Jacob and Israel are the same person. They just call them different names. Anyway, 
There you go. Now you know. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his other, than all his other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And so some context for Joseph, so you guys know, um, Joseph is one of 12 brothers, which is a whole lot of brothers. I have only one brother, and that's a lot in itself. So <laughs> I only got one. Um, so imagine being the youngest of 12. He's the youngest. And the Bible makes it very clear that Joseph is his father's favorite. And we don't get many details on that, but I'm sure that relationship is not the best between him and his brothers. Um, this idea that he's the favorite son is solidified when Jacob makes Joseph something that will identify him apart from his brothers. And this we just read was a coat. Oh, no, did we read it there? No, we didn't read it there. Yeah, we did, we did. The robe of many colors. And so I have an image of what this potentially looked like. Um, I don't know if it really looked like that because I don't think it's possible for us to know, but um, this is like, an image that I like to refer to as what it could have looked like. Joseph's there. He looks pretty fly with the coat on. Um, so that's kind of what the coat of many colors looks like. And it has different names, but we'll call it the coat of many colors for today. Um, and so I want to stop here and talk a little bit more about, well, we can keep the image up actually. I want to talk a little bit more about what this coat, what this is actually represents. And so um, we today, we get to know the entirety of Joseph's story. We have the book right here in front of us so we can read it. Um, the entire thing, but Joseph doesn't know when he receives that coat what it actually represents. He doesn't know the journey that the Lord is about to understand all that. Um, but you see, the Bible, um, it tells us that Jacob loved Joseph more than his other brothers, and a product of that was this coat. And so that, that means that the coat represented the favor that Joseph receives from who? From who? All right, now y'all wait. His father. And was Jacob God? No. Is Jacob the Lord? No, Jacob is a man. And so in other words, we can say that this coat represents the favor he received from man, the favor of man. And so is this bad? Is this a bad thing? Is the favor of man a bad thing or is it an evil thing? Not necessarily, no. You know, the Bible actually encourages us to love one another and honor one another. In Romans 12, 10, it says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in honor. However, it is, when, it is when we, the receivers of that, begin to rely on that. When we begin to live by and abide by what others have said about us, it can get a little dangerous. And so if somebody says, Joe, you are an amazing speaker. Like, I love when you speak. And now suddenly, I'm rerouting my whole life, like my whole life plan I want, to be a, I want to travel now. I want to be a speaker. I want to be a famous evangelist. Is there anything wrong with speaking? No. Is there anything wrong with teaching the word of God? No. Is there anything wrong with being a, No, there's nothing wrong with those things. But did the Lord tell me to do that? If I pray for one of my friends and they're like, Joe, you were so on point. Like, what you prayed for me, like, it happened. Or like, the Lord used you in such a mighty way. And now suddenly I'm changing my whole life plan. I'm throwing my degree out the window. I didn't even go to college, actually. But like... <laughs> I'm just like changing all my plans to pursue the prophetic. And now everybody that I meet, I have a word for you. <laughs> Is praying for people bad? Absolutely not. Is the prophetic bad? Absolutely not. But did the Lord call me to do that? See, sometimes we will dictate our destiny by what man has spoken over us without ever asking the Lord what he thinks. Y'all actually want me to say it again? <laughs> They be saying that. Well, sometimes we dictate our destiny by what man has spoken over us without ever asking what the Lord, what he thinks. And see, um, I want you to know that no man can qualify you. No man can legitimize you. They can make you feel good. Like words, the five love languages, words of affirmation make me feel so good. I love when people tell me I did a good job. But no man can ever make me worth anything. But it's as we resist the favor of man. It's not that it's a bad thing. We can, in, we can accept compliments. We receive honor well. We have to learn how to do that. But we do not live by what people have spoken over us. It's as we begin to resist that favor of man that we be, and, and as we continue to trust the Lord that we begin to see him be faithful back to us time and time and time and time again. See, the favor of man, it can be accurate and it can be very true and it can be very genuine. If I compliment you, I'm being genuine. Like, it's not like it's fake, but it can never be what you build your life on. 
Did you guys get in that today? Awesome. Let's continue back with, with Joe. His name is Joseph. We should give him a nickname. Joe. So right after verse 4, we learn something new about our friend Joseph. Um, it starts at verse 5 to about 11, but I'm not going to read all that. Um, I'm just, just so you know what I'm referring to. Um, but we learned something new about Joseph. We learned that the Lord speaks to Joseph through dreams. And he's also given Joseph the ability to interpret the dreams that he has. And I like to think that Joseph was this innocent guy just because, like, we share the same name. And I just like to think he was a great guy. Some people read the scriptures and they perceive him a little differently, maybe a little prideful. But nonetheless, either way, Joseph has two dreams. And in these dreams, the Lord is revealing to Joseph what is to come. I'm not going to read the dreams. You can do that if you have the Bible in front of you. But the Lord is revealing to Joseph what he will do with Joseph in the far future. And so Joseph naturally shares the dreams with his brothers and his father. And um, when he shares those dreams, a deep jealousy and hatred is rooted inside his brothers. It's so deep that, in fact, his brothers decide to kill him, which I think is really dramatic, but it's what they decide to do. They decide to kill him. They make a plan. Um, and they, sorry, sorry, my mind just went somewhere else. But <laughs> um, they decide to kill him, but thankfully, um, they end up choosing to spare his life. Um, and they still decide to abandon him in the wilderness. And what happens next is really, really important. And so we're going to move on to stay in the same chapter, Genesis 37, but go to verses 22 to 24. Should be right there. And we're going to read that together. It says, and Reuben, Reuben is one of Joseph's older brothers. Reuben said to them, them being the other brothers, Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. Say robe. robe. Say robe a little bit louder. Robe. The robe of many colors that he wore. And they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty with no water on it. And so what's happening here is Reuben is one of Joseph's older brothers. He is like, guys, we shouldn't kill him. Let's just throw him into this pit so we don't have to kill him. Um, and then secretly, Reuben, in his heart, he's like, I'm going to go back. After we leave, I'll go back and I'll save him. Um, and so they throw him into the pit. And verse 23, look at verse 23. It should be highlighted up there. This is really the whole message in the sentence, but it's um, the main thing that I want you guys to get here. And it's really the main revelation that I even received this whole message through is when I was reading this story and I read this sentence. It says, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. And I was like, I've read this story so many times, but I was like, Lord, why is this so detailed? Why is this part highlighted in a way where it gets its own sentence, the robe that he received from his father? What's so important about this robe? And this verse is so vital to the story of Joseph. It sets up his life and it sets us up as the readers for everything else that is to come. You see, we already discovered that the coat was a product of the favor of man. Favor of? Man. Favor of? Man. It was a product of man's favor. And so what's happening here? We see Joseph is being stripped of man's favor. And this puts the whole entire story into perspective if you think about the rest of the story, which we're about to get into. Joseph had to be stripped of everything that he knew. What did that coat represent? All the love that his father had bestowed upon him, all the compliments all the things that he got and that his brothers didn't, that's the reason why his brothers hated him. Everything that Joseph knew about himself was represented in that coat. And as soon as his brothers stripped it off of him, Joseph was stripped off, was stripped of man's favor. And he had to first be stripped of man's favor before he could ever be sent off onto the journey to discover what, what the Lord's favor really means. And so this sets us up. This sets Joseph up. You guys following Everybody, everybody, everybody together. Stripped of man's favor before he can receive the Lord's favor. It's better really good. As you continue to read the story of Joseph, um, we talked about his brother Reuben. Um, they, he actually doesn't come back and save him. They end up selling him into slavery. Um, so Joseph, from the pit, he's sold as a slave. Um, and now he is sold to an Egyptian official named Potiphar. Potiphar. And so if you just think about Joseph here for a second, he's grown up his whole life. Um, he's the youngest and... He's his father's favorite. I'm sure he was babied, and I'm sure he was spoiled. I don't know anything about that. And <laughs> that was a joke. I'm literally the baby. And <laughs> he, 
he's going through this immense culture shock, like the culture shock of culture shocks. Like you are being ripped out of your home, betrayed by those who you called your brothers, and you're thrown into a new environment with, like you're sold as a slave. And Joseph at, at his home, I'm sure he was treated like a prince. I'm sure he was treated like royalty. And now he finds himself living under the rule of a, of a master named Potiphar. And now he's going from being treated like a prince to being treated like a slave. Not just treated like a slave. He's going from living like a prince to now he's a slave. He has to work. And so his whole life is turned upside down. See, at his father's house, Joseph was treated like royalty. And now he's living like a servant. Can you imagine what that must have felt like for him? We're going to jump right back into the word. Genesis chapter 39. It's just the page over. Well, for my Bible, it's just the page over. Um, chapter 39 and then verse 2 to 4. It says, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. Oh, hold on. I'll say. Uh, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor, say favor, favor. say favor again, because I think some of you are going to understand where we're going now. So Joseph found favor in the sight, in his sight and attended him and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. And so the first thing to note when we read this is that the Lord was with Joseph. And so no matter what Joseph felt in this situation, right, like the Bible doesn't tell us Joseph felt sad but like you can put clues together if this happened to you joseph was just a man like he was just betrayed life turned upside down new environment crazy switches to his life um despite what joseph felt or how he what the things that he thought about the situation the predicament that he was in the truth is that the lord was with him and it says next that because the lord was with joseph god's god caused everything that he did to succeed and he blessed the handiwork of joseph and so because of this, Joseph finds favor in the eyes of Potiphar. And so you begin to see the pattern here. Once again, Joseph has received man's favor. Once again, just like he did with his father, he's receiving the favor of man. And Joseph is entrusted to oversee all operations in Potiphar's house. Anything that happens in Potiphar's house, it's under Joseph's rule. It's under his jurisdiction. Joseph is now just second to Potiphar. Again, is the favor of man necessarily bad? No. It's a good thing that Joseph was entrusted with those things. But Joseph will soon learn that, once again, he cannot rely on the favor of man. And so the Bible describes Joseph as very handsome. I think it's just a must-have if your name is Joseph. And <laughs> just kidding. The Bible <laughs> describes Joseph as very handsome. And Potiphar's wife takes notice of him. And so she tries to seduce him, and she actually tries to sleep with Joseph multiple times. She makes these advances on him. But Joseph remains faithful first to the Lord and also to his master, Potiphar. And he refuses. Every time that she makes an advance on him, she, he, he refuses. However, Potiphar's wife becomes very, very angry and upset with him about his refusals. And so she decides to wrongfully accuse Joseph and claims to Potiphar that he had tried to sleep with her. And so here we are again. We saw that Joseph had received the favor of man again, but now he's also betrayed once again. And it's because of these accusations that Potiphar decides to throw him in prison. And when all seems lost again for Joseph, when everything seems like it's downhill again, the Bible reminds us, reminds us of who is really in control. In that same chapter 39, if you skip down to verse 21... It says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. I'm going to keep reading. It's not going to be up there, but 22 says, and the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. Joseph was just in charge in Potiphar's house, and now he's in charge again in this prison. The keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. It says the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord is with him and whatever he did, the Lord made to succeed. And so for the sake of time, I'm not really going to get into super great detail about the rest of Joseph's story, but I do want to give you a quick overview of what happens next. And so Joseph again finds himself in a position of being dependent on the Lord in this prison. He's in prison. And again, like when we read these stories, sometimes we can just mindlessly read through and we're like, okay, like Noah built an ark, 
like Moses, God used Moses to part the Red Sea. Like we sometimes just read these things, but I want you to like really understand, like think of Joseph as a man that lived and walked and like, what was he really going through? And so he's in this prison cell um, and the Lord uses his gift of interpretation, interpretation of dreams, the one that we referred to earlier. He uses it again. And so J Joseph meets two people. He meets a baker and a cup bearer. A cup bearer just means somebody for the king, the king used to sit on his throne and the cup bearer, whenever the king would receive a drink, the cup bearer's job was to drink it first. And so he would bear the cup of the king, drink it. And if it was poisonous, he died. But if it wasn't poisonous, it was safe for the king to drink. Um, and so just, you know what that means, but the baker and the cup bearer, he meets these two and they have these dreams and they have, they want a meaning of their dreams. Um, and they have no word to turn obviously, but Joseph says, Hey, I like, I know someone who does, like, I know the Lord can interpret these dreams that you have. And so the baker shares his dream and the baker's dream, um, Joseph interprets it. And it turns out that the baker is going to be taken from the prison and it sounds good. And then Joseph says, but you're going to die. Your dreams means your dream means that they're going to kill you. Um, and so that's not super great news for the baker, but the cupbearer, he also shares his dream. And Joseph says, you also will be um, taken from this prison and you will be put back to your position as cupbearer. And so the cupbearer gets good news, right? That's good news. Joseph's one request, he asks nothing. There's no payment involved. They're in prison. They don't got no money. So there's only one request was that uh, the cupbearer would remember Joseph once he got out, right? That seems fair enough. So the cupbearer is released from prison and sure enough, he forgets Joseph. He doesn't remember him. And a whole two years go by in prison and Joseph is forgotten. And so from Joseph's father's house to the pit, to Potiphar's house, to a prison cell, Joseph's story is one of what seems to be trial after trial after trial after trial. But yet the scriptures, especially when you read it, there's this pattern. It uses the same sentence a time and time and time and time and time and time again. Through every trial, it says that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord is with Joseph. And so why is that? Was Joseph made like extra special in the womb? Was he the chosen one? Was he just made to be better than you and I or the person next to you? No. Was he more valuable than us or more important? No. The secret behind Joseph's story was not that he's better than us or better than anybody else, but it was his faithfulness to the Lord. See, when Joseph was sold into slavery, he had every excuse to feel despair and to feel defeat, but he remained faithful to what the Lord had given him and the Lord was with him. When Joseph is falsely accused, when he's thrown into prison, he has every right to give up. He has every right to say, I, I'm done. I'm in this prison cell. This is it. I've, I've, I've gotten too much that I did not deserve that I'm done. He has every right to say that. But his response is to be faithful again with what the Lord has given him. And the Lord was, come on, the Lord was, the Lord was. And so Joseph was faithful. He refused to be influenced by man's favor. And God was faithful to show Joseph the Lord's favor. He was faithful to give his favor to Joseph. And so after um, the cupbearer is released from prison, I'm going to make this super quick, but you can read, in the, read the story of the Bible yourself and get all the fun details. The story of Joseph is so beautiful. It's so amazing. But um, the cupbearer is released from prison. And um, two years, two whole years go by. Joseph is forgotten for two years. And um, the Pharaoh, who is like king of Egypt, top dog in Egypt, he has two dreams as well. He has two dreams. He needs an interpretation. He pulls together everyone, all the magicians that work for him, all the prophets that work for him, anybody that works for the Pharaoh, he brings them before him. And he says, these are my dreams, interpret them. And they're not able to. They, they don't have what it takes to understand what the Lord is saying to Pharaoh through his dreams. But the cupbearer remembers someone. The cupbearer remembers Joseph. And so the Lord pulls Joseph from the pit again, once again. And Joseph is put before the king. And Joseph is able to interpret the king's dreams. The Pharaoh's dreams. And I'm not going to get into the rest of the details, like all the... This happened, this happened. But the Lord exalts Joseph. 
After trial, after trial, after trial, the Lord exalts Joseph. See, the, see Joseph interprets the, the Pharaoh's dreams. It's an accurate interpretation. And then the Lord gives Joseph what? Wisdom and strength. Joseph ends up saving all of Egypt. This one man saves all of Egypt. And so we see Joseph who started in the what? The pit. He's exalted to second in command of all of Egypt. Second only to the Pharaoh himself. The story of Joseph does not end there. Um, but for the sake of our context, it does end there. So um, he goes on this beautiful journey of forgiveness and and reconciling with his brothers who had betrayed him. Um, but above everything else, I believe that a lot of us can see ourselves in the story of Joseph. If you haven't already, I want you to think about that now. How have you been like Joseph? See, Joseph was betrayed. I know some of you have been betrayed. Joseph was falsely accused, and I know that some of you have gone through the same thing. Joseph was forgotten and abandoned. But above it all, Joseph remained faithful. And so if you maybe in, in life, I have no idea what you guys are going through, but maybe you feel a little bit lost, a little bit confused, a little bit unsure about what you're supposed to do next, a little bit uncertain. We're called to have the same response that Joseph had through every trial. I trust you, Lord. That's what we say. We say, I trust you, Lord. And, and if it all crumbled away tomorrow, I will remain faithful to you, Jesus. See, Joseph's story brings us to the end of Exodus, and I got to hurry up because I'm running low on time. Joseph's story brings us to the end of Genesis. I'm sorry, Exodus. Genesis. And it wraps us up with a beautiful bow. And then the next chapter, uh, the next book of the Bible is Exodus. And Exodus starts with a man named Moses. We're not going to really dive too deep into his story. But in the book of Numbers, I'm saying book, 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 book. But in the book of Numbers, which is like a few books down, the Bible reveals something that's so important about Moses, and we have to understand this before we leave. So open up your Bibles to Numbers 12, 6 through 8. If you don't have your Bible, look at the screen. This is the Lord speaking. The Lord says, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream but not so with my servant Moses. He is, he is, he is in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. And so remember that this is the Lord God, creator of the universe, all powerful Lord speaking himself. This is the Lord speaking. And what has he just said about Moses? He says, Moses was faithful in all of my house. And it is because of this faithfulness that the Lord decides to speak to Moses directly. See, it says the other prophets had to receive a vision or a dream, and that needed interpretation. And so there was extra work that had to go into it, but not with Moses because Moses was what? And so the Lord spoke directly, mouth to mouth, face to face with Moses. And guys, this is a really crazy thing if you're really starting to understand it. This is telling us that it's faithfulness that leads to true relationship with the Father. And so today, my heart cry, my prayer for you is that we would say, Lord, find me faithful. Lord, find me. Let's say that. Lord, find me. Say the whole sentence. Lord, find me faithful. But just like us, I'm wrapping up, I hope. I got to hurry up. Joseph and Moses were both just men. They were not God. Joseph and Moses walked on this earth with their feet just like mine, on the dirt, on the street. They bled just like me. They sinned just like me. They worried and they feared and they were scared and they had anxiety and they didn't know all the answers. They were men just like us. Were they faithful? Yes. Were they humble? Yes. Joseph and Moses could never amount to perfection, but long after Moses was dead, buried in a grave, one came who was. One who is perfect in all his ways, who is faithful until the end, one who gives up everything for you and for me. See, Jesus Christ is our ultimate example of what faithfulness looks like. And so we might be able to learn things from the story, from the life of Joseph. Man, I relate so much to the story of Joseph, but I will never, can never, it will never work if I build my life upon what Joseph went through. 
I build my life on Jesus Christ alone. So let's look at Jesus. Let's look at Jesus. I love this part. I love this part. I love this part. This is what I was talking about in the beginning. Learning the Bible is so exciting. Just like Joseph, Jesus was betrayed by those he loved. Just like Joseph, Jesus is wrongfully accused. Just like Joseph, Jesus is abandoned. Just like Joseph, Jesus is forgotten. Just like Joseph, Jesus is sold out. Just like Joseph, Jesus is stripped of his robes. But Jesus does what Joseph could never do. The perfect faithfulness of Jesus Christ looked like dying on a cross and paying the price for you and for me that we could never pay. Today we get to reap the fruit of that sacrifice that Jesus made on that cross when he spilled his blood and broke his body for you and for me. That happened over 2,000 years ago. But today you sit in that seat right there, that blue chair you're sitting in, you get to experience real freedom today. You get to experience real freedom from sin and from hurt and from pain, all because of what Jesus did all those years ago. Yeah. I'm going to close with this, I think. Hebrews 3, this is going to the New Testament now, so you're going to skip a big chunk of your Bible. 3, um, Hebrews 3, verse 2 through 6, I'm going to start, at like, I'm actually going to start at the end of verse 1, I'm going to read it real quick. It's going to be on the screen if you need it. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, who appointed Jesus the Lord, just as Moses also was faithful in all of God's house. For Jesus had been counted more worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has, more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. This is the part right here, verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a servant, say servant, servant, to testify to these things that were to be spoken later. But Christ, Christ, Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. Say son. son. Oh, like you believe it. Son. son. And we are his house if we indeed hold fast to our confidence and our boasting. And so the Bible points out such an important comparison. Moses is faithful as a servant, but Jesus is faithful as a son. See, they don't, they're not faithful for the same reason. Moses shows amazing faithfulness, but Jesus shows perfect faithfulness. Because of Moses, oh, this is so good. Because of Moses' faithfulness, only he, can you go back to the scripture in Numbers? Because of Moses' faithfulness, only he could be in the presence of the Lord. Because of Moses' faithfulness, he could approach the holy mountain. He could gaze upon the Lord. He could be in the Lord's presence, but nobody else could. They still needed to have those dreams and those interpretations. So Moses' faithfulness was good for him. Moses was faithful so that he was right before God. But Jesus was faithful so that we all could be right before God. And so it's through Jesus' is faithful. Oh, that is a real good quote on there. Looks like the Jeopardy game, doesn't it? Um, the, 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 when Jesus died on the cross, the veil is torn. And it's through that faithfulness that we all are let into the presence of the Lord now. Not just like Moses who, and I'm not shaming Moses. Moses was a great man. Love you, Mo. But Moses was faithful so that he would see the face of God. But Jesus was faithful so you today could see the face of your father. And so today, church, my encouragement is to you is to be faithful in the good times and the bad times and the in-between times. And every time, we choose to be faithful, especially when it's hard, especially when you're in the pit or you're in the prison cell. We learn from Joseph how to be faithful in every season. We learn from Moses that it's faithfulness that brings intimacy to the, with the Lord. But today, we, leave, we live free from sin because of the faithfulness of Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you.